2018, this is, this is the bit that kind of impressed me because this is before the pandemic and, um, and you guys, and I want to know why you, you know, how you went through this thought process, but you decided to kick off with uh, City Road Go, which is a digital product. Um, so you're basically going into technically a very different business model. You, you, you're, you've gone from a bricks and mortar business where you're getting people in, running classes face to face, to a product which involves technology, a physical product which has got to be brought in, distributed, serviced, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you've got to sell it in a very different way as opposed to in New York, you're in New York and I guess there's a certain amount of passing trade where now you're starting to try and sell to people that you, you know could live anywhere across the country. So why did you decide to do that before everybody else jumped on the bandwagon You know, and it was obvious to do, you, you got in very early. Why did you decide to do it? And then again, how did you go about trying to create a product that would allow you to differentiate what you're doing with with everybody else in the market at the time that's that's all you want to know matt um <laughs> we, i i get this question often and in in retrospect like it felt very natural for us to go into that path i think because my, both my co-founder and i came from the tech world so the idea of building an app and creating content was way easier than even than thinking about how do we accelerate our four wall business. <laughs> and so I think that that's just happenstance of who we are and our backgrounds. And so it made us really, really, really well positioned to have the confidence to bet on that category early. We also knew that this was always going to be a big business. I never wanted to have a couple of studios. I always wanted to go big with it. And so I actually took a step back in 2016, 2017 and made some big decisions as the on the business, right? I had backfilled with someone to manage the studios and I was able to take a step back and say, where are we taking the company? Do I go raise money and we do corporate stores and we're the next soul cycle of rowing? Do we explore franchising? And as part of that discovery, the early numbers at a Peloton just kind of kept whispering in my ear and they kept whispering at me through investors too. I have this one of my, the very first check into the business serial entrepreneur. His name is Dan Reich, big mentor of mine. He was like, go do that. Go do that. And in the beginning, I was like, what are you talking about? We have this brick and mortar business. We're printing money. Like, what are you talking about? And then, you know, he started talking a little bit louder and I started seeing it as well. And I saw an opportunity for us to just actually create an MVP, right? What's so how do we crawl, MVP? walk, run there? An MVP, okay. a, you know, minimal viable product. So okay. how can we get something in there and just test it? I also, back to your fundraising question, always found it very hard to raise for a brick and mortar business. The second I started talking about technology and subscription revenue, doors were opened, conversations started happening. And so you have to go with the flow to some degree and building an app and delivering our content was the easiest decision of all time. And unfortunately, I also knew we did not want to be in the hardware business, right? We're already in brick and mortar, subscription software. And so we partnered with our longtime manufacturer and partner in building out the City Rogo Max machine, the, both the first one, which launched later in 2018, and also the one that launched in 2020. And, you know, very fortunate that our manufacturer also saw an opportunity here and was our seed capital. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty great um a great spot to be in because uh, I, I, yeah, I, getting involved in a product business and everything that's, that goes ar around that and sourcing and quality. No thanks. <laughs> so, so did that and, and, and so you say they also invested in the business as well at the same time. So they were, I, I guess, you know, they had quite a bit of skin in the game, I suppose. They did. They were, they were a capital partner to get the first MVP of the app up and running. Uh, and they also knew that they were going to get the hardware sales alongside mm. us. And we built a really strong relationship over time. So, oh, yeah. so it all comes back to relationships, Matt, in that, you know, when I finally went to them with this crazy idea, they'd seen us execute in the market for a really long time. And we brought some complementary skill sets to the table that they didn't have. They're inherently like a B2B, you know, manufacturer. And we brought this really cool, sexy, direct to consumer business, lifestyle business, female focused business into the ecosystem that brought so much awareness and press for a modality that they never seen before. And they also have always wanted to deliver a, more experiences and more options to their existing clients. 
And so there was a lot of synergy. And by the time we decided to, you know, do a deal together, we kind of already had that knowledge about each other. So it was a little bit less scary, I like to think. Mm, yeah, great, great decision. How did you market that then to, you said on your second studio, you didn't quite have the marketing dialed in. What was it like now to start marketing direct to consumer? I know myself, it's very expensive to do that. Um, where, where did you start in order to sort of to build that? And, and, and how did that sort of whole thing evolve of, of letting more people know about what you're doing and why they should buy it? Because it takes a little bit, as you say, people understand running and cycling, uh, hence Peloton, but I suppose rowing and then a rowing class, it, it may need a little bit more explanation. So how, how did that all come together? Well, it's a good thing I made that mistake with studio number two, because at this point yeah. I had a, I had a, you know, paid marketing agency that we would then spin up for the digital. But we actually launched, talk about assessing demand and learning from your customers. We actually launched directly to start with just an iOS and an Android app. So we still are today, but we're actually very hardware agnostic. So you can take a city row class, you can stream your content alongside any rower globally. Actually, half of our subscriber base does not own our hardware. You have access to a concept too. You have access to a water or any rower anywhere. You can be a city row member and part of our community. And so we launched that way day one. And we launched into the community of people that already owned a water rower because we were partners with water. Rower. We want to take learnings before mm. we invested in the larger machine. And so our first 800 clients were free because we had we were able to tap into own media channels of our partners. So really, really, really scrappy. At the same time, we're also building a website and doing some really great content and, and collateral and commercials to be able to actually go wide with, uh, with paid media across channels through our first agency partner. And so a combination of many factors, but always believe in like, where are your customers? Where's your lowest hanging fruit? It's getting more and more expensive now. So we're constantly thinking, what own media channels can we tap into? What like-minded partnerships can we tap into? And I am always down for a conversation or a chat with someone that we can share audiences with that make a lot of sense, that feel organic, uh, but that we can all have a win-win and not give our money over to Facebook. So what, have you, what do you find now? Because uh, it, it is becoming quite expensive on things like Facebook now, a lot of competition, particularly in fitness. So have, have you, what, what's your sort of go-to one in that consumer side at the moment then? Is, is, it, is it just partnerships or are you still using the likes of Facebook, Instagram and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of brands have to have a presence there as much as possible. But our strategy this year is how do we diversify as much as possible and month over month reduce the percentage that we're, we're, we're spending in that space? Because it's just, it's really inefficient. And it's also just, you know, my second tech company, we talked a lot about who do you trust? People trust their friends and their, and their family and then complete strangers before they ever trust the brand. And so leading a lot more into influencers, bringing on board our first celebrities later this year, which we're very excited about that feel really aligned and on brand and authentic. And so we're trying to tap into partnerships that feel aligned um, as how we're going to grow the brand forward. When you look at your app, you're, you've come from that background. So my guess is it's, it's something that comes relatively naturally to you. But did, did you go into the, the technology and the content creation, trying to find some angles of where you could do something different than a lot of the fitness apps? Because I, I guess just in, you know, you've got the production of the, of the um, uh, workouts is one thing, you know, you can have a basic experience or an amazing one, depending on the equipment they use and how you deliver that. And then also you've got the functionality within the apps and how you engage. Peloton have obviously done a great job with the way that they compete and, and things like that. So so what, what about yours did you, if anything, decide that you were gonna have as, as something unique to uh, City Row Go? We wanted to honor our in-person experience and try and match that gold standard as much as possible. So for us, it was how do we translate what people are getting out of a studio? And step one is like, you have to understand what you're translating that's resonating and creating value for people. And so for us, we know that our clients love the variety. They love how dynamic classes are and they love our ethos, right? We take a very different approach to fitness. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We're here for empowerment. We want you to do this so that you can go lead a great life. Like 
again, we're not here to beat you down. We're here to build you up. And so for us, it's a lot in our personality and who we are and how we make people feel. And so the hero for us is the video. It is the content. We quickly learned that there was an opportunity to do a wide variety of class times. So 20, 30 minutes actually became really important for us as we were driving engagement. And then we were like, wow, people want to row more. We've only ever done this 50 minute hit class. Now a 30 minute hit class, 20, they really want more rowing. Why? Right. But once they have a rower, they fall in love with, they want to do more. Hey, here's an opportunity for a distance class, an endurance class, a power row class. And so we started listening to the consumers and building out complementary um, class types, which also included mobility. People's hips get tight, right? People want to, we, we actually forced people to do some mobility and yoga. If we did challenges, it was like X amount of rowing classes, hit classes, strength class, but you got to do one mobility class if you want your badge. Um, and so we try and feed people broccoli, but put a lot of cheese on it. Right. And when you say badges, are you rewarding people for going through different levels to, to encourage retention? Absolutely, Matt. And there is no value to the badges just yet, but you better believe they will email customer service if they have not gotten their silver badge.